I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. My name is Michelle Riley, and I am the Development Associate with the Broadhead Watershed Association. Today, we have the expertise of Master Gardener uh, Amy Girardi with us. Amy is a resident of Barrett Township, and she has worked for a local garden center tending the stock of trees, shrubs, and perennials. She particularly enjoyed helping customers make selections that match their preferences with their site conditions. I want to let everyone know that we will be recording today's webinar and we will have a few minutes at the end for questions. So please submit them through the chat box function at the bottom of your participant screen. And at this point, I'll let Amy take it away. Okay, good morning, Michelle, and thank you for the introduction and for helping out today. I'd also like to thank Michael Stein for providing us with technical support this morning. And a big thanks to Edie Stevens and the Broadhead Watershed Association for inviting me to give this webinar as part of the Greening Mountain Home Project. And of course, thank you to all of you who have registered and are making time to attend this webinar today. Um, as Michelle had said, um, please put your questions in the chat box. Um, we will be setting time aside at the end for some questions. Um, that said, I'd, I'd just like to quickly draw your attention to the bottom of the screen. There's an email address at the bottom, monroemg at psu.edu. Um, there's a chance that someone may ask me a question that I just can't answer today. Um, that is the hotline, the garden hotline run by the Penn State Extension Master Gardeners in Monroe County, and they look at each inquiry individually. Our goal is to provide unbiased, research-based, accurate answers to any horticultural inquiry. So that would be a good resource uh, if you have a question that I can't answer today, or if we run out of time, or questions anytime during the garden season. Uh, the hotline usually runs April through October. So even if it has nothing to do with this particular webinar, that's a really good resource for our community. So, um, Yes, we're gonna be talking about gardening uh, for water quality today, but specifically we're gonna talk about how native plants affect water quality. We're also gonna talk about ways we can incorporate native plants into our landscapes. And I'm gonna spend a good bit of time reviewing a sampling of native plants that do well in our climate and growing conditions here in Barrett Township and neighboring townships. Because what we put in our landscapes truly does affect more than just our landscapes. So wherever we live, we live in a watershed and everything we do impacts our surroundings in some way. We're gonna talk about how we can reduce our impact on the streams that drain our watershed and the wetlands, springs, seeps, and groundwater that feed those streams. Now, it may be hard to believe that even just one landscape could have an effect on water quality, but it does. And it doesn't matter if your property is large or small. It doesn't matter if a water body is within your property or miles away. What each of us puts in our landscape impacts upon our local streams and affects all water bodies located downstream. So after precipitation reaches land, some of the water evaporates back into the atmosphere. But other water travels to water bodies either through the soil as groundwater or travels across the land surface as runoff. The way water leaves our properties impacts the quality of our drinking water sources. And water quality can be measured by various factors such as flow level, temperature, sediment content, and chemical content. We influence flow level by our use of water or by how we allow it to either absorb into or flow off of our properties. We influence water temperature by the amount of time we allow it to stand exposed or by the amount of shade we provide. Sediment levels are influenced by the amount of earth we leave exposed to erosion and we influence water chemical content by using fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides, even the organic ones, that run off into our surface water or enter groundwater. Uh, here in Barrett Township and neighboring townships that are located within the Upper Broadhead watershed, we are so fortunate because we have clean streams. But because the balance of nature is easily disrupted by our activity with far reaching effects on water quality, human health, and the living ecosystems around us, we should make keeping our local streams 
and the watershed healthy and clean a collective priority. Now, most people agree that landscaping adds value and character to our properties, enhances aesthetics, and provides property owners with outdoor spaces to enjoy. Landscaping our properties instills us with a sense of pride. We want to look at our properties and find them visually appealing. But how our landscapes are designed and maintained significantly impacts the land and water around us. And until quite recently, landscape design has been dominated by a conventional approach. This approach only considers appearance. It doesn't consider how both the design and maintenance practices impact the environment. Large lawn areas require routine mowing that leads to soil compaction. Non-native plants that don't support native wildlife and require the use of fertilizers to promote blooming, and they tend to have higher water requirements. And toxic chemicals are used to control weeds and pests. Conventional landscape design and maintenance practices degrade the environment. It leads to habitat destruction, soil erosion, and water pollution. But more and more people are realizing that an ecological approach to landscaping, such as using native plants throughout the landscape that not only support small native wildlife like pollinators, but they also reduce, even eliminate the need for mowing, the use, and frankly overuse, of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. They reduce or eliminate the need for supplemental watering. And all of this helps to protect and improve the environment by creating wildlife habitats, by reducing erosion and runoff, and by filtering water, keeping surface and groundwater sources healthy and clean. And all of this can be done without sacrificing visual appeal and personal enjoyment. And I assume that's why we're all here today. So now as we go into the next section, I'm gonna ask you all to please use your mind's eye and take a mental walk around your landscape. What do you notice first? So for example, when I picture my landscape, the first thing I see is natural wooded area on all sides of my yard. Do you have natural wooded areas on or adjacent to your property? Because in this area, we are very, very lucky to live in and around so many acres of wooded or forested land containing native white pines, oaks, maples, hemlocks, witch hazels, pin cherries, service berries, wild mountain laurel, wild rhododendron, ferns, wintergreen sedges, etc. Woods are good. Woodlands contribute to the cleanest water sources. Because after a rain event, much of the water on trees, leaves, branches, and stems evaporates back into the atmosphere. Then the force of the water hitting the ground is reduced by the tree canopy and litter layer. And this helps to protect the soil from erosion, which is why forested areas have very little runoff. And due to the abundance of leaf litter, fallen branches, decaying trees, snags, and stumps, animal and microbial activity, and an abundance of plants' roots, Forest soils are very high in organic composition, and this makes them naturally porous. This allows precipitation to infiltrate and slowly move through the soil where it's filtered clean by the time it becomes groundwater and reemerges in our streams. So whenever possible, it's a great practice to leave the wooded areas on or around our properties in their natural state. Now, if you're like me, you take walks through the woods. I love walking through the woods. And when you do, you may see or pass by the things in these pictures without even taking notice. But the ever-present decaying tree snags, the downed trees, the ground plants, such as the mosses, sedges, and wintergreen, and the leaf litter are all essential in producing clean water. Now, in my landscape, a dominant feature I notice is a lawn. Do you see lawn in your landscape too? Probably because almost by default, the majority choice ground cover of residential landscapes has for a long time been lawns, often referred to as mowed turf. While turf is durable, it holds up under foot traffic pretty well, making it easy to enjoy being outside for recreation or social gatherings. Plus, we're accustomed to having lawns and we're comfortable with the way they look. But outside of that, a lawn's functionality is minimal 
and a flawless green lawn comes at a high environmental cost. As I mentioned before, conventional lawns require mowing. Fossil fuel powered push mowers and heavy riding mowers cause soil compaction, so little rainfall is absorbed and it runs off much like it does over paved surfaces. But besides regular mowing, conventional lawn maintenance also prompts the use of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides that contaminate runoff and groundwater, and that's a big source of water pollution. Now, hard fescue grass seed mixes are getting attention as an alternative to conventional turf grass. These mixes contain fescue seeds that may or may not be native to North America, but they are considered to have ecological benefits. Fescues do not require fertilizers. They don't require, they don't require other chemicals because they're less vulnerable to grubs or other insect damage. And once established, they're also very drought tolerant and require less frequent or no mowing. And fescues can grow in full sun, part shade, even deep shade, and they maintain a dark green color. Uh, fescue mixes are available at some of the big box stores and there are online sellers as well. I can tell you, we're exper experimenting, my husband and I, with some fescue. We, we put down section um, of seed and it seems to be working out so far pretty well. And our hope is to replace um, a lot of our conventional turf with the fescue. Now landscapes that include an abundancy and diversity of plants, especially native plants, are critical to slowing, dispersing, cooling, and cleaning water before it reaches a tributary. Native plants do not require fertilizers or pesticides, and once established, they have lower water requirements. They have longer and deeper root systems, which reduces the need to provide water during dry conditions, and it helps to increase water infiltration, which reduces runoff. Lessening or virtually eliminating the need for supplemental watering reduces overuse of our groundwater supply and helps to maintain tributary recharge. Now, as we continue our mental walk around our landscapes, for those of us who have mowed turf, especially large areas of mowed turf, one of the ways we can incorporate native plants is by reducing turf area. And some examples of how this can be done include expanding existing garden beds or create new ones. Add plant borders along walkways, driveways, decks, patios. Add native trees and shrubs and perennials along the edges of our properties. These are all great ways to add native plants to your landscape, even if you don't have large areas of mowed turf. Now, whenever you're looking to add plants to your landscape, please remember the gardener's mantra, right plant, right place. This means you need to understand the site conditions, specifically where you intend to plant, and you need to choose plants whose needs match your intended site conditions. And site conditions can change throughout your landscape. So for example, on my property, I have areas in full sun where the soil is on the drier side. I have other areas that are mostly shade where the soil stays pretty moist. And I have areas that are partly shaded with dry soil. So even with low maintenance, native plants, right plant, right place matters. So now we're going to talk plants and what I'm going to be attempting to do now is share with you a selection of native plants that will thrive in our area. And without making this impossibly long, my intention is to highlight specific plants for various site conditions and landscape uses, but also native plants that should be pretty easy to find. Now I know the Broadhead Watershed Association holds an annual native plant sale. This one this year was scheduled for June thanks to COVID-19, it's going to be rescheduled this fall. That sale is a terrific way to obtain native plants for your landscape. So I used the list of plants the BWA has ordered as a resource. But I have been at the plant sale last year and previous years and it always has great turnout and plants can sell out quickly. So I've also tried to steer my focus on plants that should be available at local garden centers. So let's talk about plants that like full sun and moisture to dry sites. And it's important to note that full sun means six or more hours of direct sunlight a day. The sunlight has to be direct, but the hours do not need to be consecutive. So for example, a full sun location could have four hours of direct sun in the morning 
be shady during midday, but then get three to four hours of direct afternoon sun. Penstemon digitalis, or by its common name, beard tongue. Mid-spring into mid-summer, so like May through June, there are different varieties of penstemon. Some have greenish leaves and white flowers, others have reddish green leaves and pink white colored flowers. And as Klepsius tuberosa, the butterfly weed, this is a late spring bloom through late summer, so June through August. You mostly see the orange blooming variety, but there are others that have yellowed colored flowers. And as a type of milkweed, it's a host plant for the monarch caterpillars. And both plants are great in pollinator gardens, or you can mass them in sunny areas of the landscape you want to naturalize. And when I talk about naturalizing, because you're going to hear me say that frequently, I'm talking about outside the garden bed. Softening edges of your property, where you can just kind of let these plants naturally do what they do and reduce, reduce turf area. There are lots of different varieties of Coreopsis. They differ in leaf texture, but also flower shape and coloration. And Coreopsis, by its common name, tick seed, it blooms spring into the summer. So it usually starts blooming around May and will go through July, or even some of the varieties will go into the, uh, into the fall. Use this in groups, in the front of garden beds. Use it in borders, along walkways and paths, or along sunny property edges. The name tick seed, by the way, comes from the appearance of the seed that looks like a little bug, resembles a tick. But other than that, there's no danger in planting Coreopsis in your properties. You're not gonna have a tick invasion. Heliopsis helianthoides. The common name is oxeye sunflower. This typically reaches a height of three to four feet, but it, some varieties can get as tall as six feet. It's a late spring bloom into the summer, and it's great for a perennial border or even a cutting garden can also be used for naturalizing sunny property edges. Eliatris spicata, also called blazing star, sometimes you see it listed as gay feather. It's a summer bloom, so July and August, and some varieties can grow up to four feet high, it may require staking. I am kind of a lazy gardener. I don't like staking. Part of the problem is it's very hard for me to get a stake deep enough into the ground to provide adequate support, so I like this variety called cobalt. It's a more compact variety uh, that does not require staking. But both of these plants work great in perennial borders and for naturalizing. And they'll attract pollinators as well. Physostegia virginiana, the obedient plant. This blooms either pink or white in July through September. Now this plant as a straight species, and when I say straight, straight species, I'm talking about how nature intended it. It's unfold around with. A lot of times, plantsmen will crossbreed plants to bring out different characteristics such as flower color, how tall a plant grows, its resistance to diseases, and so forth. But the straight species of Physostegia spreads by rhizomes, which are stems that grow outward under the soil from the plant. They have little nodes on them from which little root hairs sprout and form roots. That's how that, that plant spreads. And this particular plant kind of spreads aggressively. It's not a good plant for inside a garden bed, but it would be great for naturalizing areas. If you like the look of the plant and you want to put it inside your garden bed, then I would suggest checking out two varieties, either Miss Manners or Pink Manners. They're more compact, they have a more of a clumping habit, habit and they don't spread. They don't spread aggressively. Phlox subulata, one of my favorites. I have a bunch of phlox in the front of a garden bed that is, it should probably start blooming like crazy this weekend because we finally have sun. Also called moss phlox. So many different colors of shades of pinks, blues, purples, and whites. It blooms now, April into May. Use this in rock gardens. Use this for edging in the front of a sunny border. And as you can see in the middle picture on the left, I think it looks great when it's dra draping slightly over walls or rocks. And it's just three to six inches high. This makes a great ground cover. And just a word about ground covers. Throughout the rest of this talk, you're gonna hear me mention, this plant's good for a ground cover. This plant's good for a ground cover. Probably a lot of us also use hardwood mulches in our landscapes. And there are benefits to mulch. It helps to suppress weeds, helps keep moisture from evaporating. But there's something else you should understand about hardwood mulch. And that is over time and with the help of rain and wind, mulch tends to become 
compacted. You get these patches of mulch clumped into these crusty topped masses, which doesn't really allow water to be absorbed as readily and it can add to runoff. Also, a lot of hardwood mulches are dyed for color. So I recommend if using a hardwood mulch, first choose a non-dyed natural mulch, but also use a hoe or a straight rake to turn the mulch in the spring and then again in the fall to prevent compaction. Now that said, reducing, even working to gradually eliminate the use of hard mulch uh, by using ground cover native plants is a great way to add them to your landscape. It offers, of course, the same benefits as mulch weed suppression and reducing moisture evaporation, but I think the plants do a better job of preventing runoff. And personally, I think plant ground cover is way more attractive than mulch. And Rebecca Fulgita, the black-eyed Susan. This is a nice long bloom, June through October. Mass this in big drifts in a perennial border, put it in your pollinator garden, naturalize areas of your landscape with it, and it makes a great cut flower. Andropogon gerardii, the big blue stem. I think tall grasses tend to be underused in landscapes. Big blue stem can grow four to six feet high. And at the bottom picture there, you can see kind of that reddish purpley color. That's, that's its bloom. And you'll see it start around September. If you leave it standing through the winter, the grass, it can go into February, that color. This is effective. You've put it in the rear of a border. You can use it as a vertical accent. It's also great when it's masked. You could even use it as a screen. And this grass is great for erosion control. And please don't forget about our trees. Quercus ruba, a red oak, it's a great canopy tree. It's durable and long-lived, and at maturity at 50 to 75 feet tall with a canopy just as wide, it makes a wonderful shade tree or a lawn tree. And just a side word about our oaks, if you're interested in planting for wildlife, our oaks uh, uh, support an abundance of native wildlife. There's caterpillars that depend upon the tree for food, and then there are birds that depend upon the caterpillars to feed their young. Oaks are a great thing to have in the landscape. Okay, now we'll talk about plants that like full to part sun, but also moist to dry sites. And it's important to note part sun means four to six hours of sunlight a day. Iris cristata or dwarf crested iris reaches like six to nine inches in height. This is early spring bloom, so around now, April. Looks lovely in rock gardens or perennial borders or a woodland garden. And even after the flowers are done blooming, you can enjoy the foliage as a ground cover. Phlox stolonifera, the creeping phlox. This blooms like July through September. This is a lovely ground cover for woodland gardens and shade gardens, for naturalizing areas. And it can be effective ground cover for early spring bulbs. There are early spring bulbs like Virginia bluebells, things that come up in the spring early, they put on their nice show, but then the plant goes dormant by summer. So you can plant things like Phlox stolonifera over the area once, uh, where the, the bluebells are, because then when they're dormant, the Phlox expands and you don't have these bare patches in your garden. Pucara, coral bells. You see these everywhere. There's so many varieties of coral bells. And the colors of the foliage, they range from dark purples, almost black, and I think there is a variety called obsidian. Dark purples, reds, greens, even most chartreuse colors, even light caramel colors. These tiny bell-shaped flowers appear on these wiry stems, from June into August. And the flowers are pretty, especially when they're in large drifts. But I like planting heuchera really for the foliage. I think it provides color and contrast to rock gardens, perennial borders, in shade gardens. It's also a good edging plant, and you can mass it to form a lovely ground cover. Aquilegia canadensis, it's wild columbine. It's probably starting to bloom right now. The wild species, remember, I pulled around with blooms red with yellow center, but there are cultivated varieties featuring flowers in blues, yellows, and pinks. And these flowers are attractive to hummingbirds. So put this in borders, put it in cottage gardens, put it in woodland gardens, use it for naturalizing. Amsonia Tabernay Montana, the blue star Amsonia. Those pretty blue star-shaped flowers appear in the spring around May, hence the, names, the name of the plant, blue star. It's pretty easy to grow. It looks great when it's planted in groups or drifts. I think Amsonia adds texture 
and fall color to the landscape. The bottom photo shows another variety, the Amsonia hubricti, has a very fine foliage. It's almost like a fringe. Both of the plants, both of the Amsonia varieties, turn that gold yellow color in the, in the fall. So if you have that planted, especially near something that's red in color, like uh, certain varieties of nine bark, or you can landscape with blueberry plants that turn scarlet, certain viburnum that, that turn burgundies, it provides a lovely contrast. Phlox paniculata, or garden phlox. Lots of different varieties with different flower colorations, mostly pinks and whites, but there are blues. This, line, this bloom's pretty long, July through September. Now, it doesn't mind drier soil, but it does not like drought. So if Mother Nature gives us an extended dry period and you have Phlox paniculata in your garden, you might need to give it a drink. And it's also important to note with Phlox, you want to plant uh, with a little extra space between the plants to allow for air circulation. These are one of these, these plants that are susceptible to a disease called powdery mildew. Um, David is a cultivar you see on the top left corner with the white flowers that is grown, uh, not only known for its white blooms, but it's supposed to be resistant to powdery mildew. Humid conditions or extended wet periods are great conditions for producing powdery mildew. So if your plant is supposed to grow to like a three foot spread, then maybe you want to install it at three and a half to four feet apart to allow for a little extra um, space. Anyway, garden phlox is a staple of the perennial border, as is the Ganesha purple, the purple cone flower. You see this everywhere with good reason. Those purple pink blooms start appearing in June, they'll go into August and beyond. There's lots of different cone flower uh, colors, flowers blooming in whites, yellows, oranges. Both of these plants, the phlox and the echinacea, are excellent for massing in borders, for naturalizing areas. They make great cut flowers, and they both mix well with other perennials, such as black-eyed Susans or liatris, and all of them attract pollinators. Hydrangea aborescens, another one of my faves. I have like five of these growing alongside my garage. This grows to be about three to five feet tall and wide, and you get those big, large flower clusters, look like big snowballs. They'll start appearing in June and they stay on the plant into the fall and then eventually they'll start to turn brown. This prefers part shade. It can tolerate full sun, but if you put it in full sun, you need to make sure that your soil will remain consistently moist. And this blooms on new wood. So what that means is you can cut this hydrangea all the way down to like six inches above the soil line in late fall. And what that does, is it will help to maintain the plant's shape and stem vigor as it grows back the next season, and it won't interfere with the plant's ability to flower. So mass this or group this in part shaded areas of your mixed border shrub, your woodland garden, or use it as a background for a perennial border. It's great for naturalizing woodland margins and for softening, softening your property edges. And viburnum nudum grows five to 12 feet tall and wide. Those small white flowers that you see in the top right, they eventually, they'll, they'll appear April into May, but then they give way to become clusters of berries. And those berries are important food sources for birds. And those rich dark green leaves turn shades of red and burgundy in the fall. So use this as an accent plant in a garden, in a, in a garden bed. Use it in shrub borders, foundations, or hedges. It's also a really good selection if you've got low wet spots or places to plant along streams. Here are two wonderful understory trees. Amelanchier canadensis, the service berry, and Circus canadensis, the eastern red bud. Both of these flower in early spring. Service berries are in bloom now, um, and they both flower before the leaves emerge. The service berries white flowers will give way to small berries that are an important wildlife food source. And the red buds get loaded with pink flowers in May. And once the leaves emerge, the red bud leaves are heart-shaped. There are lots of different varieties of red buds, including dwarf. I believe there's um, ace of hearts, I think. It tops out at about 15 feet. And also weeping varieties in the bottom. There's pink heartbreaker and lavender twist. Both of these trees look great along woodland edges but can also be used as accent trees in your lawn or in garden beds or as patio trees. 
The service berry can also be effective along stream banks and ponds. Cornus Florida, the flowering dogwood, another wonderful understory tree that blooms white or pink in early spring, like April or May. And you see the red arrow pointing what's called the true flower. That's actually the flower, that little cluster, uh, which will eventually become red berries. Those petal-like structures that surround the flower are called bracts, but it's the whole thing that gives the dogwood its showy appearance. Those fruits mature in late summer and early fall. They'll persist until late in the year. And like I said, especially for migrating birds, it's a very, very important food source. But this is a beautiful, wonderful tree for your front and or backyard near patios and decks. And it has good fall color as well. Pinostrovis, the eastern white pine. An evergreen canopy tree can reach 80 feet or higher. Um, we see white pines all over growing in the wild. I love the white pines. I love the long needles and the, and the pine cones. They're a fast growing tree. They can grow more than a foot per year, which is why they are among the tallest canopy tree. But because they're so tall, they're also a little more susceptible to wind blow. So if you put a pine in your landscape, I don't recommend putting one near your house or other structures. But if you like the look of the white pine, you don't have the space, consider this cultivar, the Pinostrobus pendula, the weeping white pine. It's a semi-dwarf cultivar with weeping and trailing branches. And it typically grows six to 15 feet tall with a larger spread. I used to work for a, a landscape designer who likened them. He thought he, they looked like big hairy monsters. And the form is variable depending upon how it's been pruned and trained. So you can use this as an accent in the garden bed. You could build a garden around the base. Okay, now we'll move into plants for full to part sun and moist to wet sites. And remember, part sun is four to six hours of sunlight a day. Asclepius incarnata, the swamp milkweed. This prefers full sun for flowering. Those pink or mauve flowers bloom in July. And like its relative, the butterfly weed we talked about earlier, swamp milkweed is another host plant for the monarch caterpillar. Helenium autumnale, the sneeze weed. Yellow flowers, they look similar to cone flowers, um, and they bloom late August into October or through October. There's different varieties with different flower colorations, and they look great in borders. And Shaloni lionii, pink turtle head, and if you see the flowers up close, they really do look like little turtle heads. Those pink flowers appear July through September. Now this too spreads by rhizomes, but not as aggressively. It's not considered to be invasive. So you can use this in woodland gardens or in a shade garden for naturalizing. All three of these plants are good for using in uh, pollinator gardens and for naturalizing moist to wet areas of your landscape. Iris versicolor, the blue flag iris. Those violet blue flowers appear May through June. This plant looks terrific. If you can group it in sunny areas near ponds or water gardens, and Lobelia cardinalis, our cardinal flower, that scarlet red flowers appear July through September. This is great moist areas of a woodland area, shade gardens, wet meadows, also along stream banks. This adds late summer bloom and height to borders as long as the soils are kept uniformly moist. Both of these plants attract pollinators and are also good rain garden plants. And just a little fun fact to know and tell, when, when I say they're attractive to pollinators, when you look at the flower of the blue flag iris. You can see those white and yellow lines radiating it from the plant center. That is nature's way of signaling pollinators. It's like a runway directing the insect to the center of the flower where the food is. That's where the nectar is. Menarda, a member of the mint family, the bee bombs, summer blooms. There are different varieties with lots of different flower colors. They come in reds, lavenders, pinks, white, provides color and contrast for your perennial border, for native plant gardens, for naturalizing along ponds and streams, and it's also a good pollinator plant. But this is another one, like the Phlox paniculata, that you want to allow a little extra space between the plants when you install them, because this too is susceptible to powdery mildew, although I think they are crossbreeding varieties to make them more resistant. And Panicum brigadum, the switchgrasses. 
This is a great vertical accent where you can plant it in groups or masses. It can be effective as a screen. Put this in a perennial border, put it in a pollinator garden. It's also appropriate for water gardens and along ponds. And you can see the, the picture on the right, it gets that gold, that yellow color in the fall. So it also adds color texture to your garden. Ilex verticillata, the winter berry. It's a deciduous shrub, it will drop its leaves. It typically grows between three to 12 feet tall. There's a lot of different varieties of it that um, it, it'll grow to different heights. But it's important to note that winter berries are dioecious. That means they're separate male and female plants. And only the fertilized female flowers will produce those attractive red berries. And generally, one male winter berry is sufficient for pollinating anywhere from six to 10 female plants. Those berries persist into winter after the leaves have fallen, hence the name winter berry. Also an important food source for birds. And Cornus cerisia, the red twig dogwoods or yellow twig dogwoods, they're straight species, remember, unfold around with like space. There are cultivars that are more compact, but the straight species can grow six to nine feet tall and eight to 12 feet wide in moist soils where these plants can be allowed to spread and form thickets. They can also be helpful to prevent erosion along your stream banks. Both of these plants are excellent for rain gardens, for putting in low spots, uh, like I mentioned, along streams or ponds. They both provide food for wildlife and give beautiful color to your landscape in the winter. Acer rubrum, the red maples, beautiful canopy tree, gets red flower clusters in late March into early April, which is an important source of pollen and nectar for early foraging insects. Use this as a shade tree for your lawn, but note that the red maple has kind of a flattened, shallow root system. So you don't want to plant it too close to driveways or walkways because it may cause them to buckle. So if you have the space, it makes a great shade tree and enjoy the beautiful fall foliage. And Betula nigra, the birches, this is a river birch. They can be single, uh, uh, single trunked or multi-trunked. Has that reddish brown bark that peels away, it exposes a lighter inner bark. It's a feature that most people find visually appealing. It's a good accent plant or put it in small groups for lawns, and in particular, it loves wet soils. You see it growing near ponds, near lakes, or if you have a wet low spot on your property. Okay, now we're moving into our last grouping of plant examples, and these are the plants that not part shade or shade um, and moist to drier soils. Part shade is two to four hours of sunlight a day, and shade is less than two hours of sunlight a day. Acteia racemosa, love this plant, I love this plant. When this thing's in bloom with those tall flower spires, this thing can get four to six feet tall. And it blooms around August and those flowers are fragrant, pleasantly fragrant. It adds height and late summer bloom to a shaded part of the border or in a shade garden, it's also, Great for naturalizing woodland margins. And there's different varieties. The one on the right has that purplish color. I think there's a variety called Hillside Beauty. I love that purple foliage. I think it just makes a great contrast to any other shade garden plant. Polystichum acrostochoides, the Christmas fern. It's an evergreen fern. It likes dry to moist soils, naturalize woodland margins with it, or use it in shade gardens. You can also plant Christmas fern in shady areas along walls or foundations. And it's a good plant for massing on slopes to help combat soil erosion. And Polymonium reptans, Jacob's Ladder. My favorite variety of this plant is called Stairway to Heaven. Those little blue flowers start appearing uh, in the spring somewhere, you know, it can start April, go into June. I love the flowers, but this is another one that I plant for the foliage. I love that cream colored margin on the leaf. Um, people say this, this plant can take full sun, but I, I think it's happier in part shade. And it just looks great if you have a rock garden or for naturalizing wood areas. It's just a lovely contrast to other things in your shade garden. And Dicentra eximia, the bleeding heart. This will bloom April through June. Actually, as the temperatures increase, it'll flower less. Uh, but it looks beautiful in shade gardens and borders. Um, it's similar in appearance to the Asian 
Belizean heart, the Asian variety, which is Dicentra spectabilis. Um, the Asian variety grows bigger and wider, and honestly, it's, it's the one you're most commonly gonna find at local garden centers, so it is important to notice the difference. But the Asian variety goes dormant by summer, which is not true of our native variety, Dicentra exinia. That will, will stay um, growing, and when the temperatures start to decrease, you might actually start to see a few late season flowers. Erythrum felix femina, the lady fern. This is a nice plant for shade gardens and rock gardens, woodland margins, shady border fronts. Lady fern also does well on shaded areas along streams and ponds. And geranium, maculatum. Again, this can take full sun, but I think it does better in part shade. You get the small pale pink or deep pink or even lilac colored flowers in May, April and May. So put this in areas of borders in your shade garden, in your woodland gardens, and you can also mass it to use it as a ground cover. Mertensia virginica, the Virginia bluebells. This blooms late winter. They'll start blooming sometimes in March and early April. And the flowers initially bloom pink and then they turn blue. But as I mentioned before, the foliage dies back to the ground by midsummer when the plant goes dormant. Now you can mass this in moist, shaded, wooded areas or shade gardens. You can use it in borders or rock gardens. But remember, since the plants go dormant, it's a good idea to overplant them with other perennials, such as ferns or the phlox stolonifera, because they'll expand as the season progresses. And Tiarella cordifolia, the foam flower. This looks great when it's planted in mass, when it's in flower. Those white or pink flower spikes start appearing in May. So put them in shaded rock gardens, put them in woodland margins and border fronts, or along moist areas, along stream banks. You can mass it to form a ground cover. And that's what the foliage, that little picture there shows you what the foliage looks like in fall. Calmia latifolia, mountain laurel, Pennsylvania state flower. Prefers part shade and can grow anywhere from five to 15 feet tall and wide. It's evergreen. And those pinkish white cup shaped flowers appear in late May and will stay on the plant for weeks. You mass this in shrub borders or put along natural, for naturalizing woodland margins. You can use it as a hedge or as a foundation plant. It complements rhododendrons and azaleas. And speaking of rhododendrons, rhododendron maximum. This also can grow pretty big, five to 15 feet tall. It gets pink white blooms in June and July, it's evergreen. So when the mountain laurel is finishing up, it's flowering, the rhododendron is getting started. So put this in shrub borders or other shady locations. This is great also for naturalizing those woodland margins of your property. And Sogo canadensis, the eastern hemlock. An evergreen conifer for shady areas of your landscape. You can use it as a lawn tree or even as a privacy screen. It does really well in moist areas or lower wet areas near streams. And there's a weeping variety, Sogo canadensis pendula. This only grow to be somewhere around five to eight feet tall, but it gets wider, maybe a spread of eight to 10 feet. So it can be an, a neat accent in your landscape or garden bed. And folks, normally I would heartily encourage anyone with the right site conditions to consider adding a hemlock to your landscape. But I need to mention, we need to be aware of and concerned with the hemlock woolly adelgid. It's a tiny Asian origin sap sucking insect that was accidentally introduced to the United States, I don't know, sometime back in the 1920s, I think. And it's been a threat to wild and cultivated hemlocks in the eastern United States. Now, for this reason, I debated over whether or not to even include the hemlock in this webinar today, but I chose to include it because I wanted to remind people about the importance of the hemlock. It's a beautiful native shade tree. And well, there's no guarantees should a hemlock uh, get under attack by the woolly adelgid, but if that hemlock is growing in ideal conditions, it has a better chance of survi surviving the effects of the, the woolly adelgid. When plants are not growing in ideal conditions, they are more susceptible to disease and more susceptible to insect damage. And they succumb to those damages because they're already stressed and struggling. So that's just another reason why right plant, right place matters. Okay, folks, we've just spent some time together talking about how native plants 
positively impact our environment and our watershed. We've reviewed a variety of examples of native plants that in the right site conditions would make lovely and environmentally beneficial additions to our landscapes in Barrett as well as neighboring townships. I hope you found the information I've shared with you today enjoyable and useful, but I also hope it encourages you to make an effort to determine where you could add native plants to your landscape and maybe give you some ideas of which plants might match your site conditions. Establishing native plants in a garden or a landscape, it requires work just like any other plant. But once established, native plants will save you time, save you money, they'll enhance your landscape's natural aesthetics, and hopefully you would also derive pleasure and pride knowing that by choosing native plants, you're helping to improve the environment and helping to keep our watershed clean and healthy. So just in conclusion, I just have some tips and resources for you. One, remember the gardener's mantra, right plant, right place. Understand your light and soil moisture conditions, specifically where you intend to plant. Then choose plants that you like, but whose needs match your site conditions. Two, a newly installed plant has to get used to its new digs, literally. After installation, plants need time to establish their root system. That is the plant's number one priority. Everything else comes later because without a well-established root system, plants have a hard time taking up water and soil nutrients. They'll struggle and sometimes they don't survive. So during this time, which is usually the first year, you may need to water occasionally so that the roots don't dry out. And third, be patient, they're perennials. Don't expect an abundance of flowers or fruit, even significant growth during the plant's first year. There's a little rhyme that goes with perennial garden and that is the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. So with that, here's just some helpful websites. The Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. This hosts the native plants of North America. This is a guide to North American native plants and a free and searchable database of information on more than 9,000 plants. It's wildflower.org. And the North American Native Plant Society. This has information and tips about growing native plants. NANPS.org. And then Plant Native. This includes a nationwide directory of native plant nurseries plus regional plant lists. And that's plantnative.org. So I thank you all today. Here is, again, the Monroe MG at psu.edu. If you have questions at any time, if I can't answer or after this webinar is over, as well as for more information on native plants, plus everyone who registered should have gotten a, a copy of native plants for our climate zone. If you didn't, you can use this Broadhead Watershed website to get yourself a copy of that. Plus, keep yourself posted on the Broadhead Watersheds Association rescheduled date in this, this fall for the annual native plant sale, as well as a list of plants they hope to have. So thank you again, and I guess we'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, would, would you like me to read you the questions from the chat box, or can you see them in there? I can't see them, so if you would read them, that would be great. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, there's a few. So the first one was about the fescue grasses. Um, can you oversee the fescue in bare spots or do you need to remove existing sod? Um, that's a good question. Um, we actually, I think it's a good thing to help things take root if you can remove what's there. But I'll tell you what we're doing in, in our, we just, we had some bare spots as well as some, well, we call it grass, but it was mostly weeds. And we just put the seed down and it's coming in kind of thick. So if you want to just kind of experiment, um, if that's not clear enough, then I would suggest you use the, uh, the uh, hotline for further information about planting fescue. Okay, next question. Um, which native plants are best for bees in general? Anything that produces pollen, anything that produces flower, and it's, 
Um, and native plants are always the best way to go. There is a, a, a long, um, the handout that would have come in your, I think you would have gotten it via email or the one that I mentioned, you can get it through the Broadhead Watershed uh, website, has a whole list of plants that, um, that mostly they're, they're usually full sun plants that bloom and if you're trying to attract bees or just pollinators in general, it's important to try to choose plants that not only match your site conditions, but get ones that start to bloom in the spring and other ones that will bloom in the summer, and then ones that bloom in the fall, so that you have a steady supply of nectar and pollen. Also important to notice, when you see cultivars, if you see things that are, say, double flowering, um, sometimes when they crossbreed plants to make them more attractive to people, they're less attractive to insects. So whenever possible, get a straight species or a cultivar that says it will attract pollinators. Okay, right. next question is from Diane. She says she has a hydrangea that refuses to bloom. Um, she has cut it back and maybe she's looking for a few suggestions, but maybe that one's better for a follow-up email. Um, we could, I'll take a stab at it because this is a common question I used to get at the, um, the garden center. The, the, the thing is, Diane, I'm sorry, I can't give you a definitive answer because you really need to know um, the type of hydrangea that you have. There are hydrangea that bloom and they're not all native, okay? And there are ones that bloom, as I mentioned, on new wood, and there's ones that bloom on old wood, which means you leave the stem standing and the, uh, the leaves and the, the flowers will bloom on, on the previous year's growth. Um, so that's really important to, to know. Um, so if you know the variety, um, then I would research, I would look that up or send that to the hotline. But another reason why hydrangeas sometimes don't bloom is because deer, if you have deer brows, which probably just about all of us do, um, sometimes they get in and they will start to chew the little buds off before, the before it even really starts to fully leaf out. Um, and also sometimes a blast of cold weather can also damage new growth that can prevent it from blooming. But probably the number one thing to understand is the type, there's so many varieties, the type of hydrangea that you have and know if it blooms on new or old wood and then go from there. Okay, um, do we have time for one or two more questions? I see two more in here. Sure. What is a good compact native hedge to replace privet hedge? <laughs> compact native hedge. Um, I'm trying, I don't grow privet. I, I'm thinking is that part shade? I, I mean, there are different cultivars even of our, um, Calmia, the um, mountain laurel is a, is a nice, that's evergreen. If you wanted something evergreen, oh my gosh, hedges can be used. There's full sun part shed. There's also, um, depending on what, what you like visually, um, there's various nine barks. Um, nine bark is a plant that comes in different leaf colors. It is deciduous, it will drop its leaves. Um, they range in sizes. They can grow four feet high, some of them will grow higher six feet uh, tall and wide. Some flowers range in colors with reddish, uh, greens, even yellows. Um, there's a lot of, of varieties. You can also type in um, extension and you can extension um, and then type in an inquiry about shrubs, native, native plants that can be used for shrubs or hedges, or shrubs that can be used for hedges rather. And the last question I have here says, my wisteria is huge, but without flowers. Do you have any advice? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't plant wisteria. Although there are, I think, more native varieties. It's huge, but not flowering. Um, what did you, you're talking about right now, I don't, it wouldn't be flowering now, but if you're talking about last season or it hasn't produced flowers, I really don't know. Sometimes cutting plants back can help to kind of encourage new growth, I would float that question to the hotline. And again, if you know the type of wisteria that you have, um, you would include that information. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, Amy. I think that's all the questions we have.
Okay. Any additional questions can be yeah, sent to the Master Gardener hotline. Um, please um, send us any more. questions you have at info at broadheadwatershed.org. Michelle, you got oh, one. there are two more now that just popped in. Yeah. Um, I see thank yous, everybody. Oh, uh, Mike, I see one. Hold on. I'm losing it in my chat when I scroll down. We planted a few fringe trees last spring, uh, but they look dead now. What, when might they bloom if they are just dormant? Fringe trees bloom late spring and early summer. Um, but I would monitor that plant. If, I mean, it, it should leaf out. Um, it's important to know, I think they're related to the ash tree. So you want to monitor for emerald ash borer. I think that's that they can affect mm. fringe trees as well, sadly. But I wouldn't expect to see it bloom until later in the spring or early summer. Okay, I think I got all the questions then. Okay. Yeah, we look at everybody saying thank you. It was a very informative webinar. Thank you so much again, Amy. And thank you everyone for joining us on a Saturday morning. Okay, thank you.